Thanks, Simon. Um, we're going to open up for questions now. So um, we've got a microphone floating around. Uh, hopefully this one works. Um, so if you have a question, put up your hand. Wait for the microphone to come to you so that we can fit all the, uh, in, all the audio in. Simon, you've convinced me. Oh, thank you. How are we that going makes to, one. <laughs> how are we going to go with the politicians and particularly the Greens? Um, quite difficult, to be honest. So <laughs> what is perhaps most interesting is that the, um, the Coalition Defence spokesman, the Coalition Shadow Defence Minister, had in fact rejected the conclusions of my report, not on the basis of the findings, but on the basis that they wanted to go ahead and spend money in South Australia. Uh, before I'd even gotten out of bed on the morning that it was released. Um, I think, perhaps more seriously though, uh, there is a new defence white paper coming out in 2013. The Coalition have promised another defence white paper after the election. And I think that the, the tenor of the debate might change quite a lot once we get outside what seems to have been a, a two year long election cycle. So it's very popular to suggest that we're going to spend $40 billion in Adelaide because that means jobs, it means that manufacturing is supported. Um, none of these arguments, I believe, stack up to economic scrutiny, but they're quite popular. Once that pressure is gone, I think that we might be able to take another look at this. The other thing, of course, is that the capability gap that is coming is going to be extremely difficult for us to avoid, particularly since we keep pushing off and pushing off and pushing off, making any key decisions on this project. It takes something like 15 to 20 years to get the first boat of a developmental class in the water and, and operating. The Collins class is supposed to come out of service starting from 2022 um, and there's not a lot of, of gap that you can see there. So um, once they have to start spending some money and once the election's gone, I think it might change. Sorry, just we've got... Yep. Uh, just a, s a simple question. Yep. Um, if we build uh, diesel submarines in South Australia, how many people will be employed? A uh, couple thousand so at, at, at most. So it's not, it's not like this project is going to employ 100,000 people. It's not the next Snowy River scheme, although the, the scope of the, the cost is, is comparable. Um, and these aren't jobs that, in my view, will be sustained in the long term. So they'll operate for the life of this program, but because Australia has such a unique defence environment, it's unlikely that submarines designed here are going to be particularly uh, sought after amongst the rest of the world. In all the export subs are much the same. So I think it's a short-term project that would only employ you know, several thousand people. Uh, have you done any uh, 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 analysis of the number of people uh, per sub uh, that would be built in South Australia, the length of time and how much employment would actually go to Australians? Um, that's a good question and I haven't no, and I don't think that anyone has really looked at that in any sort of detail. Um, there would be a significant force imported, so um, the Rian Corporation did a report on the submarine skilling um, in, I think that was 2011, and they found that Australia doesn't have the designers or the engineers to build the submarines here ourselves. So we would have to import some of these workers anyway. Okay. Um, so just to, to, to understand, we'd have to import the workers. They're only going to be employed uh, a couple of thousand. It's going to cost at least 10 billion more. And the assumption is if we have nuclear subs, no money will get spent, spent in Adelaide and all the money will only get spent if we use diesel submarines. So have you done any analysis as to how you could do the maintenance in Adelaide so you could make apples compare with apples on the employment side because it looks like the whole argument by the politicians is about employment in Adelaide. Um, it is, and uh, I think that's quite a good summary. Um, there's, there's, two prob there's probably two components to that. Firstly, there's a significant maintenance force already in Perth where the submarines are based. And I would anticipate that a lot of those workers would keep their jobs working on the future submarines. So it, it would really, those job losses would only be on the manufacturing side and not on the maintenance side. Um, second, and I think this is, a, this is a, a valid criticism, Australia doesn't have a nuclear power uh, industry at the moment. 
and we don't currently have the facilities or the capability to do that maintenance, the deeper reactor level maintenance here. Now I think it would be cheaper and easier to get it done at US facilities, but there is certainly an option and if you look at the, the figures, it's certainly at least worth considering of simply importing that, that capability wholesale. So the US is going from 58 submarines as of a couple of years ago down to about 43 by 2028, which is when we would, we would expect the future submarines to start hitting the water. So that means there's going to be a significant amount of excess maintenance capability in the US that we should be able to, to get hold of. Um, and you know it, w it might be worth looking at putting that in Adelaide, but it would solely be a, um, a political decision designed to make people feel good about decisions. It would be more expensive and, and the capability wouldn't be as good. Uh, Chris Skinner, I have two quick observations and then I do have a question which I feel is of general relevance. No worries. Thanks, Chris. Firstly, uh, they don't have to surface to charge batteries. You do it at periscope depth. Nuclear submarines also have to come to periscope depth to use their weapon systems. The other day, one of them was uh, run down by a surface ship, a US Navy uh, submarine. There's no problem with the reactor. But it occurred because of the difficulty of knowing what's going on if you're not at periscope depth. Um, the, uh, the second observation I would make is that the nuclear industry and the reactors are extremely important issues. But they're only about 20% of the cost of the submarine. And the skills involved in the workforce, wherever it may be, 80% of them are nothing to do with nuclear technology. They're to do with all of the other things. And I feel some of that technology for deep submergence vehicles of any kind is relevant to our offshore oil and gas industry so that there are uh, transferable skills involved. It's not just about nuclear submarines. My question, though, is you made a comparison with the NBN. Yep. $40 billion. But would you agree that the spending rate on the NBN is much more rapid than is the submarine program where we're talking about a 15 or 20 year program to spend the same amount of money and therefore as an impost on the Australian budget it's quite different? Uh, certainly the spending profile is quite different and, and I thank you for those points Chris. I mean I, certainly you raised some interesting issues there. Um, yes the spending profile is is different and they are they're different projects. Um, the NBN is, is, in my view, um, a lot less defined and a lot less certain than, than what a nuclear submarine project might be. I mean, I think, oh, sorry, a conventional submarine project might be. So we're, we can be aware of what the risks in a conventional submarine project might be, and we, we know that at the end, Defence is going to take 12 submarines and operate them. Um, the issue with the NBN is different. They don't know how many people are going to take it up, whether the technology is still going to be valid in the future. Um, the other thing I would like to, to take up is your point about the nuclear power plant only being 20% of the ship. I think that's very important because some of the criticism against nuclear submarines has been based on the fact that we don't have a domestic nuclear power industry so we can't support them at all so we shouldn't do it. If a nuclear power plant is only a portion of that then why could we not get assistance with the maintenance of that portion of the ship and look at keeping some of those other skills in Australia where we already have those facilities. And I would expect that but my, my model, how I sort of conceptualise maintenance of nuclear submarine, would be that either General Electric or um, Northrop Grumman, who operate the two companies building the Virginia-class submarine, would establish facilities somewhere in Australia, probably in Perth, but potentially in Adelaide, and they would take up a lot of the existing workforce because that would be the best place to get skilled workers for the submarine operation. And what we would need is we would need assistance just with the maintenance on the nuclear power plant, and we could get that assistance from the US. And that would also, to an extent, help with the concerns about nuclear power because we wouldn't be playing around, if you could call it that, with the reactor in Australian ports, those submarines would be in US ports where they've had, as I said, 6,200 reactor years worth of operations without a single incident. So I, I thank you for your point, Chris. And we seem to be 
very locked into America in, in terms of defence anyway, to a degree that I find slightly weird. Uh, recently, various Americans with White House connections uh, came out with a remark, we'd better choose which side we're on, America or China, which is kind of terrifying to hear when we should be sort of looking for peace and trade. Now, if we lease the submarines from America, what control do they have uh, physically over it, their use? And, and also, uh, I mean, do they give them even more right politically to say, um, we're all going to go and give a bad time to so-and-so, and we expect you to be there with our submarines? I, is that a worry to you? Um, certainly, I think it's a, valid, it's a valid point, and it's a valid concern. Um, the exact ownership of the submarines would be a, a matter of negotiation. The way I see it working, it would be basically the purchase of the submarines, but we'd hand them back at the end so that the US could dispose of the spent nuclear material. So I would not anticipate that the US would be able to tell us what to do with them, except to the extent that the US really does currently have quite a high influence in how Australia operates its defence policy. So Australia is probably, I think it might even be the only US ally who's been to every major conflict the US has had in the last century. Um, so while it's certainly a valid concern, it seems like we're doing a lot of this stuff anyway. So um, I, I think it's, it's something that can be managed within that process. And I mean, we could always look at buying the submarines with, with an option to just give them back at the end and, and have the US dispose of the facilities. I just think that what we could do is we could package the whole thing up into a, into a, a package that dealt with acquisition, that dealt with training, that dealt with maintenance, that dealt with disposal, and deal with it all under the heading of one agreement. Um, certainly there's a valid concern about the relationship with China, and one of my colleagues did some work on that as well. Um, and by going on to the UN Security Council, we're going to be forced to an extent to choose between the US path and the Chinese path because we're going to have to vote for one or the other. Uh, from a defence perspective, though, we're thoroughly enmeshed in the US defence model. It would be extremely difficult for us to extricate ourselves from that. Um, the vast majority of a lot of our platforms, at least, are sourced directly from the US or involve US technology. Um, and because of the international trafficking against in arms regulations, ITARs, um, Australia can't really deal with Chinese defence technology, US defence technology the same. So um, while it's certainly an interesting question, will we have to pick between China and the US? From a defence perspective, we made that choice a long time ago. No, thanks. Um, your criticism of um, Houston and uh, Cosgrove in terms of trying to build business for South Australia is a bit disingenuous when you consider US defence contracting where every congressman and senator is after a slight of the action for the local district or state. Now in the case of the Virginia class in particular you'll be aware of arguments before Congress where they're saying why are the two shipyards building it? Yep. You only need one. So um, why not defend jobs in, Aust in Australia? <laughs> why basically outsource <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I'm not necessarily arguing that, well, uh, but I think the argument that we shouldn't have a defence industry in Australia well, is that, that's certainly not. That's certainly not my argument. Um, but what I would say is this. We've seen from the support of the car industry exactly how inefficient it is to try and prop up an industry with government dollars and expect it to somehow become... Uh, functioning operational industry. Right now, the car industry is right on the edge of falling over altogether. So support isn't particularly effective in that sense. Um, the second, and I think perhaps bigger concern, is why do we pick these specific industries as opposed to others? So why would we support the submarine building industry, whereas, for example, last year, um, the government decided to spend $3 billion to buy helicopters from the US instead of b buying similar helicopters from... Australian Aerospace in Brisbane. There's something of a pick and choose, these people are in a politically important area so we'll support them and these guys aren't so we won't. Um, and the other, I mean, the other point I would suggest is that the US model in a lot of ways is imperfect but I don't think what we want to do is import the imperfections to Australia and have them operate here. Um, I think we should be supporting the defence industry in a lot of 
ways that we're not currently doing. I think defence needs to talk more to individuals who are in defence industry. They need to communicate their requirements and their intentions a lot better. We need to reform defence contracting so that it's not prohibitively expensive for companies that are at the middle tier to bid for projects. Um, and I think that what we need is we need to mend a defence uh, relationship that's quite dysfunctional, dysfunctional between Stephen Smith and the heads of the Defence Force because at the moment we've got defence on the one hand and government on the other seemingly fighting each other. So I thank you for your point. But, but that's <laughs> Oh, of course. I just think we could do it better. And we have for a long time. Defence has been a lot less political than it is now. Um, it seems to me that there's a mentality abroad in our governing class, and judging from the last question elsewhere, that basically defence procurement is an exercise in pork barrel or nation building rather than actually acquiring useful systems for our armed forces. I mean, it seems to me that is the fundamental obstacle to... Um, apart from anti-nuclear phobias, to acquiring this, uh, this, um, this system. I mean, what can we do to counteract that mentality? Um, it's, that's quite a good question. And I'm not sure that, it's, I'm not sure that it, that applies broadly across the entirety of defence. I mean, as I said, I think there are some projects where they decide that it's going to be in their interest to, to pay extra for Australian, um, and others that, that they don't think are necessarily the case. But what I think we need to be doing is we need to be supporting companies that are efficient, supporting companies that are innovative, and helping them break into international defence markets to break down the barriers in local defence markets so that we can actually compete these projects effectively. Um, what we've got is a situation where defence doesn't provide any information to anyone, um, and then they, they do huge-scale tenders that last for five years to try and come up with an answer, and then often the, the reasons why they've picked a particular option, you know, they are, are quite opaque. I think we could reform the process in a lot of different ways where we wouldn't necessarily need to spend a lot more money to get Australian-built systems, and we could have a defence industry that was, that was able to react better to defence needs. Does that... I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question because you, you're talking about reforming an enormous section of government that has probably the worst procurement practices of, of any of them. Um, I suppose a simple question would be, if we're going to build stuff like the submarines here, is anyone else in the world prepared to buy our Collins-class submarines? Because that's a pretty good test of whether they're any good or not. Because we do a lot of defence stuff and we do sell to other parts of the world. So to me, that's the simple answer. If we build it, will anyone else buy it? Um, and that's a good question. It's, it's probably not quite as simple as if they won't buy it, it's not because it's, because it's no good. Um, one of the justifications as to why Australia needs to build submarines here is that we have these very unique submarine requirements. Um, our submarines need to travel a long way, they operate in deep water, um, they have a lot of different missions. Um, these requirements are actually fairly similar to some other countries who, by and large, have decided to go with a nuclear option for their submarines. But almost every, in fact, every export submarine is a smaller submarine designed to operate in shallower waters for shorter periods of time. They're easier to maintain and they're a lot cheaper. Now, I'm not convinced that there is a market out there for a long-range, large-sized, diesel-powered submarine because if there were, we'd be looking at buying them now. So there have been a lot of arguments put forward that this will develop a submarine building industry where we can export those submarines. But I think the very reasons why people put forward as to why we need to build them here are the reasons why we won't be able to build an export industry. Um, and it's interesting to note that the same discussions were had in the 80s around the Collins class, uh, that this would develop an ongoing shipbuilding industry, that we'd have a vibrant industry where we could, we could go forward. And it, it doesn't seem to have happened that way. Um, it seems to me that, um, listening to some of the uh, questions, uh, that as I think somebody else remarked, we'll be talking about uh, uh, defence industry on the one hand and uh, defence forces on the other hand. A and uh, some of the arguments about the need to keep jobs in Australia, with the piddling number of jobs concerned, are just, I might have done to be rude, but I mean they're, they're ludicrous. Um, so 
technically, it would appear that in terms of Australia's needs for a submarine, that's say long range, uh, uh, stay on, underwater for most of the time you're out at sea, uh, yes, if the lay-down was there, you should be going for nuclear submarines. You shouldn't even be considering upgrading the so-called or the conventional commons. Um, they're not in the same category in terms of Australia's defence needs, it seems to me pretty clear. Um, and uh, I thought a very good point which was made earlier was that uh, in terms of the maintenance, uh, you, I think in your presentation you suggested the maintenance in either Guam or uh, whatever the other place was, I've forgotten now. Um, and that struck me as a weakness in your argument at that time. I think you've replied this since in discussion by saying, well, perhaps we could have the nuclear reactors uh, maintained in those places and have the other maintenance, the non-nuclear, in Australia. I think that's, that's the way you should go. And it ought to be in, 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 in Stirling, not in the, not stuck away in the middle of Adelaide, for God's sake, just because it happens to be Adelaide. And they, they, they don't know what to do. You know, they've got no, no initiative on their part to do things, things they should otherwise do. Incidentally, if you're going to spend that sort of money to keep 2,000 jobs in Adelaide, why don't you spend one twentieth and get thirty jobs, uh, three three thousand jobs now, doing something quite different. Well, it would have been a lot cheaper to, to make up the difference in the Olympic Dam project, it, well, and would have that, probably kept uh, a lot of people final, employed. My final observation may be helpful to you. Uh, it seems to me that one argument you, you could consider making in favour of your proposition is that uh, the, the, the billions, and I think, you know, your figures are probably very con very uh, understated, very conservative, because the overrun on the Australian one would be much bigger than your allowed for in your. Therefore, the savings to go to a proven and, and basically cost-contained <coughs> program of nuclear subs will be huge. And that m ought to mean that there's more money available for other parts of the Defence Force. At the moment, the Defence, the Army is facing a very bleak future with the, what the government just done to the Defence Force in this country, which is a temporary bloody disgrace. Uh, and uh, I ought to think, at least you, if you can't get the admirals on board, you ought to be able to get the the generals. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and there's quite a few points there, and so I'll, I'll make a couple observations on that. Um, the first is that it is important to think about the $40 billion project in the context of the overall defence budget, and the overall defence budget is declining. Um, if there are blowouts in this project, then that will impact on the other sections of the defence force, and I mean, I think we're seeing that already. The JSF program, for example, is is under constant review and and they've pushed the first lot of acquisition of planes to the right, but I don't think anyone expects that's going to be the final yeah, cut there. Well, well uh, um, and that, that is a good point, you know. If you're cutting back the rest of the Defence Force, then you need to make sure that your entire force is balanced. You can't spend all of your acquisition budget on submarines and nothing on anything else because you've got a force that can do one thing very well and do nothing else at all. So it is important, I think, to make sure that we keep the submarine project in the context of the overall defence force. And when you look at it in that way, it makes a lot less sense to provide such a massive subsidy, which is what it is, for this particular project at the expense of all the other projects that have been delayed or cancelled or cut back um, it, it's, it, it's surprising to me that, that this project with its massive price tag hasn't yet um, suffered in a reduction of, of numbers. Um, take your point about the maintenance, I think that's, that's valid. I mean, um, what we're looking at here is all of the, the lower level maintenance and the ongoing maintenance would be done in Australia at a minimum. Um, and the deeper maintenance, which happens once a decade for a couple of years, it might be cost effective to do that in US facilities in Pearl Harbor. Um, it may be that it's, it's not particularly different in terms of cost to do a lot of it here and just to do the reactor maintenance there. Um, I haven't gotten into that level of detail in my paper because ultimately a lot of those figures will depend on, on you know, what actually Navy decides to do. Um, what I'd really like them to do is have a look at the nuclear option and, and apply some of the money they've spent on examining designs they've already said don't work um, to examining a design that, that might actually work. <coughs> yeah. W why haven't we heard anything from the Navy itself on this topic? Are, are, are the officers uh, afraid for their jobs or do they have to toe the party line? Or I mean, something so obviously, uh, you present such a, uh, a good argument here, if it's, why aren't we hearing anything from the, particularly the submarine officers about what they want if 
and they're the ones having to operate these kind of um, uh, unreliable Collins class. Is it, do you know, is there, any, um, is, is there support in the Navy for nuclear submarines? I've been told that there's a level of support for nuclear submarines within the Navy and within the submarine force. Um, but generally speaking, you won't see serving officers come out and talk about these sort of procurement issues, um, not because they don't think it's important. I mean, I've got no doubt whatsoever that within the submarine force and within the levels of Navy, there's a lot of debate about what we should be doing for these projects, but that debate doesn't get outside that community into the, into the broader public. Um, and I wouldn't expect it to, although I do think that there is a case for some of the service heads to come out and explain to the public why they need the money to do what they do. One of the things that surprised me, having been involved a little bit on the defence industry side, was exactly how little um, public awareness there was and how little noise was made at the, at the really very significant cuts to the defence budget in the last budget. No one really came out and said, this is a horrible thing, you've cut you know, five and a half billion dollars over four years. Um, and that's because I think that the public at large are barely unaware of the importance of the Defence Force and exactly what you get for your money. And I, would, I can only recommend that it would be enormously in the interest of the Defence Force if, if the senior officers could come out and say, this is why we need 12 submarines, this is why we need the submarines to do. I mean, don't, don't need to go into confidential details, but actually just tell people, this is why we want your money and this is what we're going to spend it on. And almost every other department in government now does that. There was a time when, you know, you took government minister's word and they said we needed this money and that's what they did. But that time has passed. And I think it would be enormously beneficial. Because what you see is retired generals and retired admirals and retired air marshals, they're the only voices in the debate from the defence side. Um, and they can only talk once they've left the defence forces. So, yes, I mean... I. There's certainly debate, and I'd love for the debate to be public because I think it would only help people to know more about what our defence forces do. Will? Yes, Simon, um, I've read your paper. Thank um, you. It's a very good document. Um, I'm quite interested um, in the overall issue. Um, certainly, I think the nuclear submarine, uh, I think from um, a political perspective, is most probably um, a bridge too far. Um, but it was seen to me with the new Japanese submarine. Um, well, with the size, but is right. It's got you know, the air um, independent propulsion. Um, it has a US combat system. That but would seem to me, you know, to be, but maybe a possible option. And I think you know that that should be you know, very seriously considered. Yeah, and so do I, to be honest. And I, th I think that was a good development um, when the the when they came out and said they were talking to the Japanese Navy about getting these submarines. So they are about the right size. Their range is a little low. Um, because of the way that the Japanese operate them. Um, the biggest problem with the Japanese submarines is that no one really knows too much about them. Japan's had a policy of prohibiting defence exports to everyone other than the US for a very long time. Um, they don't have a lot of experience in defence exporting and we don't really know how long or, or you know, how serious they are about this change in policy. Um, so we would cer I certainly think that we need to look at the Soyuz class. Um, I think it might be able to meet some of our needs with, with fairly minor modifications, um, but we need to be very careful about tying us into a, a 30 to 40 year program on the basis of, of 12 months of change policy. Um, we really need to look at that a lot more carefully, but that's, that's the sort of thing that the design studies that should be looking at. Well, but I'd just like to say, you know, obviously the, both the Germans and, and the Japanese have uh, very good experience with over a very long period of building submarines. Oh, absolutely. And I would suspect you know, the Japanese submarines would be excellent. Yeah, and, they, and the Japanese submarines, um, they have a lot of similar um, defence ties with the US to what we do. So um, the level of opera, opera interoperability is probably there with, with those subs, which is, which is uh, I think, a real positive. Um, and the cost, I've seen figures quoted at $600 million for a submarine. Now, it seems to me like that is way too small for a submarine that size um, but it certainly puts the perspective of a of a you know 40 billion dollar 12 submarine acquisition into into context uh, Chris, Chris. You know, I'd, I'd just like to make a further observation sure there's a big time scale issue here and when we're talking about 
current defence cutbacks, we're talking about a year or two, but the government has already funded, as you've said in your paper, $214 million for studies during that two-year period. It's funded. Yep. What happened last week was the issue of an invitation to participate in a joint defence industry and government uh, integrated project team, which will run for 16 months and will come to an end about the t end of that period. In 2014 will be what's called first pass approval, consideration by cabinet. Nothing after first pass is set in concrete. Not the budget, not the time scale, not the design, not the choice, nothing. All that is going on in the next two years is informing the government of the day fully of the options that they need to consider moving forward. So, frankly, all this discussion about it's going to cost $40 billion is making a very wild uh, speculation on government decisions that haven't even got anywhere near Cabinet as yet. And I do think that that should be a qualification that you apply. Yep. Um, uh, certainly, I'll take that point on board, Chris. And I, and I mean, those, those aren't my costings. They're the costings that have been done by ASPE for this project. They've been generally accepted across a I, lot I'm of different places. I'm not quarrelling with the money. I'm quarrelling with the certainty of them ever being uh, invoked. Oh, certainly not. I mean, I, I think $40 billion might turn out to be quite a low figure. Um, if you look at the initial budget for the Collins class was about a billion dollars and it sort of ended up at five, six billion. Um, I think those... The point that they would make, though, is you look at the cost of ownership as does any large organisation take it over the life cycle. So the combination of the initial acquisition cost, however big it may be, with the annualised uh, cost of maintaining them for whatever the life is that you approve or you agree, uh, is what really matters. But of course, with discounted cash flow and the <coughs> value of money in 10 or 20 or 30 years' time, it's not the yeah. Oh, look, and there's certainly a lot, of there's a lot of uncertainty when you're talking about pricing out to, you know, 2030, 2040, 2050. Um, and no one, in, from what I've seen in the debate, no one's really looked at that operational cost issue um, until I went through the figures in the Collins class. And, and it is fairly, it, it is an approximation. It is based on what the Collins class cost us now and the expectation that it will cost that in the future. Um, but... It is, I think it is important though to look at those figures because they could be, it could be much higher than that. And no one expected that the Collins class would cost a billion dollars a year at any point in time. Um, and there, it looks like it's almost a certainty to go past a billion dollars a year in this decade. Um, and that's before we need to look at a bridging program to meet a potential capability gap. It's before we need to look at what will be a much more complicated submarine um, and it doesn't take into account any of the potential issues that come up in the development of that submarine. So I'm, I'm the first to admit it is something of a, of a crude approximation, but I've been fairly conservative in a lot of my estimates, and I think, I think the likelihood is that the cost could be a lot bigger and the gap could be a lot bigger. Um, and the other point that you made that I, I thought was a really good one and is worth picking up, we are still pre-first pass. We are still at the point where we're evaluating options. Um, yet we've already rejected the option of nuclear submarines and we've rejected the option of having them built anywhere other than Adelaide. Um, and I would have thought those decisions should be included in that process because by making those two decisions, you've already really narrowed the field as to where the future submarine is going to go. Up, up the front here. Um, on this side. Sorry to ask a second question. No, uh, by all means. The more the merrier. Uh, assuming that uh, we get these new submarines in 2020, um, do you have a, um, a chart that uh, tracks what sort of submarine capability Indonesia will have in 2020 um, and uh, the capability of South Korea and Japan? Um, we talk a lot about China versus America, but i just come back from... Uh, um, uh, being in Japan and the temperature is rising between J Japan and China yeah. and uh, they're asking Australia to take sides. Um, and we're talking about major uh, trading partners and the same issue with South Korea. So is South Korea got submarines and, and what sort of submarines are 
on the drawing boards for uh, other and India and the yeah. the major countries of our region uh, for 2020. Uh, I think the concern I guess people like me have is so uh, we're a maritime uh, nation whether we like it or not um, and uh, how long does it actually take for any one of these subs to get from Stirling to the Northwest Shelf, for example. So how, how does it take a week to get to, okay. uh, does it take a week to get to the Northwest Shelf with a conventional, and how long does it take for a, for a nuclear? Yeah, so um, I'll take the second question first because that's probably the easier to answer. Um, if you're looking at transit times to and from the South China Sea for patrol, um, an eight-week patrol for a Collins-class submarine, it might take them three to four weeks to get there and back. Um, for a nuclear submarine, it would probably take somewhere in the vicinity of seven to ten days. Um, their patrols would be 90 days rather than 55. So if you look at it from that perspective, you'd probably have four weeks on patrol from a conventional submarine and somewhere in the vicinity of sort of eight weeks on patrol from a nuclear submarine. I'm so more interested in the Northwest Shelf than I am in the South China Sea. Oh, it's, that's just a, it's just a range comparison. So it's about 4,000 nautical miles there from Stirling to the South China Sea. So that, it's a measure of that distance. Um, it's probably, it, you travel at about 10 to 12 knots on a diesel submarine. You travel at about sort of 20, 25, 30 knots on a nuclear submarine. So they go about two to three times quicker. Um, so that's, that's sort of the first part of it. The, in terms of the submarine forces in the region, that is a very good question. And the 2009 Defence White Paper set out some of those challenges there. I mean, we're looking at increasing submarine forces from India who are going with a nuclear submarine option. Indonesia have picked up some of the sort of conventional off-the-shelf type models. Um, Japan are expanding their force and the Soyuz class is a reasonably recent addition and they're upgrading those. Um, and there's a lot of others in, in and around that region. Um, and they're primarily those smaller export style submarines that are easier to operate. But Australia's had a submarine advantage in the region for a long time. Our submarines have been better than the competition, arguably probably better than the Chinese submarines as well, despite their having a lot more of them for quite some time. But that gap is narrowing a lot. A nuclear submarine option would extend that gap out again. Australia would have submarines that were substantially, that had substantially greater capability than other forces in the region. Now the future submarines are likely to have a capability edge as well, but it probably won't be as big. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think that we need to look at nuclear submarines, because we've got a really challenging defence environment at the moment. Um, China, Japan, the US, there's a lot of, there's a lot of threats out there. I and mean, we haven't talked about North Korea, um, but I mean, you're looking at a defence environment that's fairly unstable. And that was one of the reasons why the 2009 white paper suggested that the Defence Force had to expand, because we needed to be able to deal with those challenges. I think the 2013 white paper will come to the same conclusion, that we've got a very challenging defence environment and we need to get bigger. Um, but it's difficult to do that if you're not willing to commit the money to make it happen. Um, I think that the nuclear submarine option would be a good way to get a capability edge. It seems like it would be a cheaper option as well. Um, but we need, to look at, we need to look at that strategic environment and say, what is it that we want Australia's Defence Force to be able to do? Who are we trying to counter? Um, and that decision should impact, or it certainly should guide the decisions as to what submarine that we go with, and other forces as well. I mean, I think that you can have that same argument with the JSF. I think we might, um, we might leave it there. Um, thank you, Simon, for fascinating analysis on all the issues and complexity. I think that's... Um